is a pleasure to virtually meet all of you. In fact, you're all looking very sharp and uh, ready to listen to my exciting PowerPoint. I promise you I will keep it uh, brief because I know how exciting PowerPoints can be. Uh, but my goal here today, and I'll, I should add just for background, I'm a 15-year member of Techos Angels, which is now the second largest angel group in the country. So what I share with you today is more on what I have known from experience, more so than what I just think. So hopefully that adds some value to our presentation today. So what I tried to prepare here is the type of content that investors are looking for. Of all the presentations I've seen, I tried to capture what's really relevant to help entrepreneurs like yourselves really put in what's really going to make it a compelling presentation. So with that said, uh, I call it a checklist for entrepreneurs, but the key word here is preparing for your presentation. I'm going to show you the content that's necessary, but I want everybody to focus on the more critical part, and that's before the presentation with the investor deck, and that is understanding the various steps one needs to follow uh, to fill the gaps and to gain enough traction to where when you're ready to pitch to investors, you have now increased your chances of getting investor interest. Okay, so let me start with the, I was hoping that would just move by itself, but obviously it's not going to. This is always fun, so let me try this. Okay, here we go. So let's start with the elevator pitch. I'm sure all of you have heard the term elevator pitch many times before. And I start with that because it is probably one of the most important slides when you start your presentation because, you know, it's in an elevator pitch, investors need to know, bottom line is, what do you do? Okay. Why do you do it? Okay. What are your key differentiators? And who is your customer? You've got about, really, about 45 seconds to articulate this to your uh, investor group or even to a customer. So by that, I mean, you've got typically, and what I've experienced many times during presentations, if, if, the, if the investor doesn't have the aha moment within about 45 seconds, you lose them. And that is not what you wanna do. Um, you, I call it cognitive drifting. It's typical of somebody starting to go off into a different direction because they really don't understand what you do. And the same thing can happen when you're talking to customers. So it's critical to practice that pitch, deliver it in a way that, for example, let's say you walk out and I encourage this, you go out and talk to four or five friends, ask them to humor you just for a minute, okay? Give them that presentation and then have them repeat back to you what they heard. And if they're spot on, congratulations. You, you, got, that, you got that figured out because that is so critical and again, Excuse me, you don't want them to put you in the wrong box. And I see that happen many times too. You want them to be fully clear before you get into your presentation exactly who you are, what's unique and different about you. Okay. Let me see here. I don't know why this is weird. Okay. So all investor pitches has got to have, and again, we're telling a story here. So keep that in mind. You want to identify the problem. Okay, what is the problem you saw in the industry or in the marketplace that caused you to want to start putting together this whole business model? So in other words, what problem have you identified in the market? Okay, following that is the solution. Okay, so every entrepreneur has identified a problem. Uh, that's why he's going to put together this plan. So the solution is how do you solve the problem that you stated? And you want to go through, and I recommend using bullet points, not a lot of graphics, not a lot of content, just use bullet points to stay right on topic. What happens with a lot of content is if you're in front of a group of investors, you got them squinting and trying to read all your content. And when they do that, they're not listening to you. So my advice is stay specific to bullet points that really defines how you are going to remedy the problem or solve the problem, okay? Market size, another critical slide. I think they all are, of course. Uh, but a market slide is, you know, they, they want to get an idea how big is the market you're going after. They want to know that you've done your homework, okay? So you've seen this before, I'm sure, the TAM, the SAM, and the SOM. 
So it's three different categories and the total available market, that's everything. If you had a lighting industry and, and you're talking about every bulb and every fixture in the whole United States or the world, that's your total available market. Then you start narrowing it down until you get down to the sum. That's that serviceable or obtainable market or that portion of the sand that you hope to capture. That's the entry level for you guys. That's, that's that area you feel like over the next five years or so, you're gonna be able to capture them. So let's say the SAM is a billion dollars. The SAM could be 50 million. That's gonna be that section of the SAM that you feel like you're really gonna go in and have an impact on. The SAM then becomes the way you would project your five-year projection. Because if you feel like you're gonna capture say $30 million of that, build your five-year projection off of that and we'll cover that a little bit later. Competitive matrix. This is one of my favorite slides, although I got a poor example here and I got to come up with something better than this, but this slide gives you an opportunity to provide a really good visual of exactly what's unique and different about you versus competition. This slide is also an excellent slide to use as a marketing tool because it answers the question that you get all the time. Why you? What's unique and different about you? Okay, versus competition. So, it's, it's as, as it is here on that first column, you would list all of the key benefits your particular model offers, okay? Next column over is gonna be your company and guess what? You get a check mark all the way down because you have all those benefits. Next column over and the next two or three columns over will be your competition, okay? If they have the benefit you're listing, you, they get a check mark. If they have it, just leave it blank and do that for say three different competitors. Now you've got a very clear visual that really, really articulates to anybody looking at this, why you? If they didn't quite get the elevator pitch, now they can see the key differentiators, which is so critical to raise capital. Everybody wants to know why you? What's, what's so unique and different about your particular business model? So this competitive matrix gives you a great opportunity to share exactly why you. Probably one of the most important slides, I know I keep saying this, is the management team. You know, we use this analogy all the time. The, the uh, investors, they gotta love the horse, okay? The horse is the business, but they gotta be madly in love. I mean, absolutely enamored with the jockeys, okay? That, at the end of the day, is who they're gonna write the check to. And they wanna know how and why you say you are uniquely qualified to run this business and build it to whatever that is over the next five years. So <clears throat> what I encourage is a brief paragraph on the, the management team was a separate slide, okay? You wanna put down really the accomplishments, the current strengths of the particular uh, person, uh, education, experience, that's what I'm looking for. If you have a PhD, I think that's great. If you don't, what I'm really interested in is your background. What makes you uniquely qualified to be the CEO, the CTO, uh, or the business development manager? So that's what we're looking for in that slide. That can make or break the whole presentation. They really want to see the team. Second slide that follows that, which is a support slide to the management team, is the advisory board, if you have one, okay? If you have one, terrific. You know, what they're looking for are you know the same thing in terms of, of background and strength, but they're looking for somebody that's been in the industry you're tied to uh, for a number of years and obviously would have networks of people that they could communicate with and a phone call from you, the CEO, to that board member could open up many doors. Uh, so that adds extra support to the management team. So the advisory board, if you have one, uh, is, is great to have it on there as long as they've got that background and experience. And, and I think everybody knows an advisory board, it's an informal board, it's not a governance board, it's just an uh, informal board, but very helpful to strengthen your team. So go to market strategy. All right, so now you've, you're, you've told the story, we've got the, the uh, elevator pitch, we understand what you do, we, we understand the problem, we understand your solution, now we understand the size of the market and we got a good understanding of your team. So you see how this story is starting to build now? So now you're starting to really get my interest as an investor because I'm following you, okay? So go to market strategy. If I write you a check tomorrow, I need to know you have a plan in place 
that set, that's going to show us how are we going to scale. Okay, I need to know what channel strategies you're going to employ to begin capturing customers and start scaling the business. So we start off with who are your customers? You, know, you want to identify this pitch. Are you going to be a B2B model or are you going to be a B2C? Both of them have unique different uh, uh, pathways towards growth. And you may be a B, you may be both initially, but really it's it's you need to define who you're going to be going after. Is it going to be the customer or is it going to be the business? Okay. Sales and distribution channel strategy. This is one of the soft or sore spots I have in most presentations because oftentimes this is overlooked and it's so critical to have this. So I'm looking for again, how are we going to go to market? So brokers, great. That would be an independent group that has access to your target customers. And what's nice about that is you pay for performance uh, as opposed to having an expensive direct sales force. Value-added resellers, again, another alliance partner who you can uh, align yourself with and they open up doors for you and your product helps open up doors for them. That's a good one. Independent reps, are, again, like brokers, these are independent sales reps that have uh, contacts and knowledge of your customers and can provide you with access. And again, you pay for performance. And then of course, everybody knows about direct sales reps. So that gives you an idea of what the sales and distribution channel looks like. Same thing applies to marketing. You know, the direct marketing, the social media, the alliance partners, <clears throat> going to trade shows, anything on the marketing side, we want to see what that is. So that's the two key areas that uh, you want to put together. Uh, when you're doing your presentation is, is how am I going to go to market? Business model. Everybody has a different iteration of their business model, but really the bottom line is all I want to see here is how do you make money? Okay. What are your revenue streams? Is it going to be a subscription model? Is it going to be a SaaS platform, which could be a subscription model? Are you going to generate revenue off of advertising? Uh, is it going to be data analytics? So I want to know what revenue streams you're going to be counting on so I get an idea of how, the, how it's going to flow. And that's really what I'm looking for here. And the more, the better, quite frankly. Proof of concept, again, there's many interpretations of this, but as an investor, the best proof of concept uh, for me is, has somebody written a check uh, for your product? There, there's no better proof of concept than when somebody writes a check, okay? so. That's, that's what we're looking for uh, when it comes to proof of concept. And have you done pilots? Uh, you know, uh, pilots or, or beta sites. It's, for us, it's critical to know that you've had a chance to do what we call customer discovery. Why is to, to do that early on, to get an understanding by talking to your customers, find out what they want, what they like, what they dislike, all the different questions you wanna have to make sure you've got the right business model. And at the end of the day, will the customer buy it? You want to get a pretty good idea of that before you put it all together. It's going to save you a ton of money. Proprietary assets. Okay, this is this is intellectual property. If, if you have it together, and hopefully some of you do, this is what we're looking for here. Primarily, it's barriers to entry. How difficult would it be for a competitor to come in and take over your business or be an, an immediate threat? Okay, do you have patents filed? Do you have provisional patents filed? Are they pending? Maybe they're issued. Anything at all relative to proprietary assets would be good to put that on a slide uh, because it makes, again, more powerful and, and more difficult for people to copy you. Another one here is critical, and this oftentimes doesn't get put out correctly, but fi financials. What they're looking for here is just a one page, okay? The format's kind of like a PL format, but they're looking for are a clear and concise current updated five-year plan, okay? And it needs to be realistic. They don't believe any of this anyway. Uh, and it's very difficult to even project five years out. So we all know that. What they're looking for here is your best guesstimate of growth. And they're looking for the growth plan. They wanna see a good trajectory going up. They don't wanna see hockey sticks where you're gonna go from 5 million to 25 million in one year. They want to see a good growth projection and it goes to credibility. You know, if an entrepreneur says he's going to do hundred billion in five years, well, there's a pretty good chance they're going to want to know what this entrepreneur was smoking before he came in. Okay. 
Again, avoid the hockey sticks. And again, it's all about a five-year projection. A lot of people try to do two years, five years is what investors want to see. Now we get to the deal, okay? Uh, the deal is, is the big slide, okay? This is going to tell us how much money have you invested. So I always recommend at the top of this deal slide, put how much money you put into it. It tells the investors you've got skin in the game. And if you've got other investors that have invested, put it all in there and start right off with that. That's impressive, okay? Then how much money are you seeking? If you're after a half a million or a million dollars, okay, put it on there. And then I need to know what is the offer? Are you gonna offer us equity? Are you gonna offer us a convertible note? If it is a convertible note, uh, you need to spell out what the terms are. Typically, if there's an interest rate and there's a discount that's gonna be offered and then if there's a cap put on it. And then lastly is use of funds. This is where they want you to put out the buckets, okay, uh, of how you're gonna spend that money. So if you're gonna go after a half a million dollars, if $200,000 that's going to go into GNA, put it on there. If $100,000 is going to go to uh, product development, put it on there. But they want to see how you're going to spend the money. But they're really looking at how much have you allocated to sales and marketing because as an investor, I can't think of anything more important than that. All right, we're almost getting to the end here, folks. Future capital needs, okay? When you talk about the raise, they're going to have an idea. How far will that money take you? And what they're going to want to hear from you is, you know, what, what are the requirements going to be? If you need another million in a year and you, th and you think that's accurate, that's what they want to know. They want to know how long the initial investment is going to last. Okay. Exit strategy. All right. Now we're almost to the end here. So every investor presentation has got to have an exit strategy. Without one, you're considered a um, lifestyle company, which is fine. And you can make very good money at it. The business I had, that's what it was. Uh, but for investors, they want to know it's being built to grow and to be acquired, okay? Uh, so typically, exit strategy would be acquisition. I recommend that you pick four or five logos of companies that could acquire you. Not that they're going to, but it gives them an idea of who would be in your space. IPOs, some people put them on there. My opinion is they're unrealistic. They're very expensive, and there's probably 45 of them done last year on the whole country, so... You know, the most popular and most realistic uh, exit strategy is acquisition, uh, merger. Uh, and then again, the likely suitors, as I put on here, you can see just some logos on there of the different people that could acquire you. Then the final slide, this is my one of my favorite ones. I call this free real estate. If you're doing an investor presentation, it's up on a screen. You've done your whole pitch now. This one stays on the screen while the Q&A goes on. Okay, so that's why I call it free real estate because it stays up there. But what the intent here is, is to bring back and summarize all the reasons why I should write a check for your company. Okay, so examples. If it's high margins, attractive. If you got a very experienced management team, that's investable. If it's highly scalable, that's investable. Any IP that you have is investable. So, and, and if you're in revenue already, that's what you want to put on there. So you want to just kind of put bullet points on there of all the reasons why you feel that the investor can't go another minute without writing you a check. So quick reminder, you're presenting to potential investors. You're not doing a product pitch. Okay. That completes my presentation. Um, I do want to add with one more comment. I have to bring this up many times. When you're in the Q&A and, and, and an investor asks you a question, just give him the answer because you want to get as many questions as you can during that 12 or 15 minutes. So if I ask you a question, I want an answer. It's, it's kind of like saying, what time is it? Some people want to tell you how they made the watch. Others will tell you what time it is. What I'm after and what I'm suggesting here is if somebody asks you a question, give them the answer. Okay. Hey, Bill, thanks. That was great. Can you leave your, can you click back the previous slide? Just leave your deck up so we can bounce around to different slides as the questions sure. come in. Sure. So, um, okay, so for those of you that just joined while Bill was uh, in the middle of the presentation, this is meant to be interactive. So we want to we want to talk about your specific uh, fundraising questions and issues in terms of a focus on the pitch deck now. And as we mentioned at the beginning, for those of you that just joined, we also have other sessions coming up in the coming weeks and days 
that are going to be focused on a bunch of other areas of fundraising. But today we're focusing on the pitch deck, what should be in it. And also when you actually pitch, what are you doing? Um, a couple of comments I'll add to uh, back up what Bill said is um, if you go back to your, um, there you go. Business model is a great one. Let's stay on that for a minute. Uh, so we see obviously not as many deals as a, as a, as a venture capitalist or an angel group like Tech Coast Angels, which Bill is a part of sees, but, but we see, I see dozens of deals every week. And um, I can tell you the three weakest areas that all the founders, especially in our region, inland SoCal region have is um, they are weak on their go-to-market strategy. Number one, oftentimes they just have a, like a, like a 101, like, oh, we're going to do social media and we're going to work with influencers. And it's just like, it's, it's, that's like the lamest. So don't, if you have that on your deck, you need to think about uh, updating it and upgrading it. Business model is number two. A lot of startups don't really uh, explain how they're going to make money. And then the third thing that we've getting a lot of pushback from investors, we work with both angel groups and we work with seed stage venture capital groups and not as much the investors, but I know a lot of folks that have applied for Riverside Angel Summit are going after seed capital from institutional investors, right? And so they are looking for milestone-based financing. So it's not just the typical graph you see with you know, sales and marketing, 20%, develop, they don't want that. They want to see an actual timeline of how you're going to spend the money and what milestones it's going to get you to. Now, not all angels will want to see that as, as Bill has said earlier, but a lot of them do. So that's another weakness that I've seen in a lot of decks. And so those are three things. If you don't, if you haven't taken them seriously in your deck, I would definitely take go-to-market strategy, milestone-based financing, and then business model seriously um, in, in terms of, um, even if it's not in your deck, you've got to be able, as Bill said, answer the questions in the room. So um, everyone, uh, no one has any questions so far. I guess everyone has a perfect deck, Bill and Martin. So I guess we, I guess we can just turn off the, uh, turn off the recording here. Oh, here's one. Okay. Okay. So Dave Smith asks, uh, what are immediate typical turnoffs and turn-ons do you personally or see or see at TCA? Very good question. And that's part of what I hope we got into today is what do you do and what do you not do? You know, and some of the turnoffs are when the entrepreneur himself or herself uh, is not coming off clear. They come off uh, as if they don't have the knowledge. Their delivery is very poor. It comes off as if they had not practiced before. And investors really want to see energy. They want to see passion and enthusiasm. And too many times we've actually seen people who probably shouldn't be the one that's doing the, the uh, presentation. Um, the other problem that comes up is if they come off as if they are not really sharing what they know. They're talking more about what they think. And investors don't want to hear what somebody thinks. They want to hear what you know. So you know that can go on for quite a while, but there's a lot of things that that can turn off people uh, during the presentation. And all I can do is stress how important it is to practice the delivery before you pitch. Uh, look in the mirror, talk to your wife, talk to your husband, whoever, but practice it, time it, and, and come off as compelling as you can because it's a sales function. That's really what you're doing in this presentation is you're selling yourself and the company. Okay? I that's a great answer. Yeah. The other thing that, um, and I'll get to the next question just a second. One thing I wanted to add is that, and Bill talked about this a little bit earlier in his presentation, but about having sim simple slides. Now, one thing I'll say to that is that I recommend that every startup has two pitch decks. One is the in the room deck and the other is the get the meeting deck. Cause don't forget you got to get the meeting. So when you're, it, it, what Bill said is exactly right. When you're in, and this is meant to be a pitch coaching session. So what Bill, what Bill said is exactly right. You want to communicate the information without having people staring at and reading slides when you're actually in the live pitch, but you need to get the meeting first. And so I would say that if you're, I, I've seen some uh, Steve Jobs inspired pitch decks or, or whoever you want to use as the, as the entrepreneur of the, you know, whatever, like with just one picture and one word on it. It's like, okay, if you're, if that's, you're in the room deck, that's fine, but that's not going to get you a meeting um, if you don't have the meeting with the investor. So have the two decks. And then of course you'll have 
dozens of other versions of those decks. You'll have your, as Bill said earlier, you'll have your short deck. Sometimes you only get two or three minutes to do your pitch. Sometimes you get a 15 minute slot with an investor. Sometimes it's 30 minutes. So you, you'd want to have um, different length decks that work as well. So again, I know a lot of you are just working on your first pitch deck. So I'm not saying that you spend a bunch of time doing 20 decks right away. But my point is that over time, as you go out to raise capital, you're going to get a bunch of decks that you're going to have a bunch of decks that you need to keep updated. Um, so let's go to the next question from um, Kissy, I think it is. I might be mispronouncing it. Um, uh, how do we get mentors and guiding us towards our pitch? Well, that's a great question because that's what we're doing right now. So <laughs> basically um, what you do is you just contact us and we provide uh, pitch deck help and coaching. In addition to Bill and Martin and me, we have in, in our UCR program, we've got 12 other mentors that also help uh, with pitch deck review and coaching. And so it just really depends on what industry you're in and also uh, what stage you're in. So um, for example, if you're uh, if you're a biotech startup, you, you may have a different group of mentors um, helping you with your pitch than if you're an ag tech startup or a B2C app company. So, it, you know, we will put you with different mentors based on what vertical you're in. Go ahead, Bill. So I want to uh, add on to Scott's comments. You know, it's the pitch deck, as I said early on, is great. All of us can do it. All of us have had a fair amount of experience at it. We pretty much can guide you through uh, a compelling pitch deck. But what's more important and where we spend a lot of our time uh, is helping you understand, again, the, what needs to be in place. It's the gaps. It, it's you know, the customer discovery. It's the working prototypes. It's all the necessary steps that are so critical to complete before you spend time on a pitch deck. What we try to do is get everything in place so now it becomes easier to do the pitch deck because you've got it all filled up and you're ready to go. Okay. Thanks, Scott. I had to. Yeah, that's thinking. a good point. Also, if, if some of you want to, if you'd rather ask your questions um, by speaking rather than typing, uh, you can just raise your hand um, and I can, uh, I think I can, yeah, it's, I have an allow to talk button here. So if you want to ask a question uh, live as opposed to typing it, we can do that as well. Um, and uh, I, I threw my uh, email in the chat there for those of you that don't know our program, which is called Epic Small Business Development Center at UC Riverside. Bill leads a program at UCI uh, that is similar. And the whole point is, is that both of our programs are uh, there to provide help to entrepreneurs to help move them, not just, not just get them funding, but also help move them forward um, towards scaling their startup. And we do it at no cost. So that's something that um, some people get confused by. They, they think that there's some hidden costs. There's no cost. Uh, we're all uh, grant funded, supported by our universities, and then also supported by uh, various corporate donors, as well as some city and uh, county donors as well. So there's no cost, nothing we're doing here has any cost to uh, the startup or the entrepreneur, and neither does Riverside Angel Summit, by the way, uh, for those of you that applied. I don't, I, I don't have all the applicants memorized, so I don't know if everyone who's here today uh, is uh, part of Riverside Angel Summit, but I think a lot of you are just glancing here at the attendees. Um, so the next question comes from Dave. Can you provide a critique of the pitch deck before investor pitches? Well, yes. And as a matter of fact, uh, we're going to be doing that, Martin. Uh, actually, I, 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 we Martin and I are talking after this event, actually, about how we're going to do that this week. But we have some time set aside with a number of our mentors to do one-on-one -on -one pitch deck coaching. Um, and that's coming up, uh, well, not just this week, but basically it's going to be happening between now and the, the final event on November 4th. Now, um, it, as- I was just going to interject, Scott. Yeah. It, it's two sessions. It's actually this Wednesday and Thursday, the 22nd and 23rd. Uh, if you get online, uh, you'll see uh, the time and dates. It's 1130 until 130, essentially. And it's called Pitch Essentials Recap and Practice Pitches. Those are your- uh, uh, those are your opportunities to present to us and the mentors and investors. And so it's the 22nd and 23rd. Your second attempt after those uh, is on the 29th of September and 30th, I believe. And that is uh, for another round of your practice pitches. So there are numerous opportunities for you to refine your skills by giving those practice pitchers in concert with and a mentor, an epic mentor being assigned to you to work with you personally on that. Yeah, definitely. And 
Also, by the way, I mean, we, we also mentor um, startups outside of this whole Riverside Angel Summit project that you're tuning into here. Uh, we, so again, like if you have a meeting with an investor coming up and it doesn't, it doesn't fit uh, with your, with th this particular schedule, Martin just laid out. I also put the schedule for the upcoming events and pitch practices in the chat here. It's under, um, it's at riversideangelsummit.com forward slash events for those of you who are just listening and not seeing the screen. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we're, we're here to help. Um, and Bill, do you have something to add? Yeah, I, it, I should have added this earlier. And that, the question that came up was very good. And, and your Martin and your answers was good. Um, a large part of the decision is not necessarily just the pitch deck. The pitch deck, I, I always consider that to be half the presentation. The other half is the delivery. I kind of alluded to that earlier. The delivery is critical. You want to make sure you practice that. You want to, because investors, once they understand the model, and, and they're, they're well into the pitch. Now they sit back and they start evaluating you, the, the CEO and the team. They wanna get a feel that you're coachable. They wanna get that feeling that you're coming off as honest, straightforward, knowledgeable. Those are the things that they're looking for. So any as much practice as you can get or, or do before you actually present is a very smart move. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, there There's, a number of times we, we've run a lot of um, well, we're, I've been a judge at a number of pitch competitions and we've also run a number of them over the years. And um, one of the challenges that it really depends on, 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 on how you present. And I think it's good to, I mean, all, all of us, I mean, I, I struggle with it stumbling along when I'm trying to, you know, so you definitely want to practice it. Like Bill said, you don't want to wing it. And the other thing you, that I, I've found that typically doesn't work unless you have this, the skill of like, if you could have been an actor in terms of memorizing lines, then memorize your pitch deck. But I, I, I've never seen it go well when an entrepreneur or founder tries to memorize their pitch deck and then regurgitate it in, in the moment. They almost always trip up and then they almost always fumble around and then they can't. So it, you should, and the point is you shouldn't have to memorize it because you should know it. You need to know it like in your gut. You need to know everything about your business. And of course you'll learn more as you, as you build it, but you need to know it enough to where you don't have to memorize um, some special way to say something. So, and, let, and let's, God, I, I couldn't yeah. agree with that more. And in fact, one of my uh, most positive experiences when I was in all of your shoes and I was on the podium is when the PowerPoint uh, went dark right at the beginning. And that meant that I had to give my entire presentation without the benefit of a PowerPoint slides behind me. That actually won me numerous points with the investors because I actually had it as part of my DNA. So uh, Scott, uh, Scott's points should really be well taken by all of you. I would argue, do not attempt to memorize lines and so forth because you'll get locked into uh, too many words, uh, too much time taken and so forth. Uh, my advice to you, to all of you would be is for every slide, ask yourself, what are the one or two main points that I want to get across? Get those points across in any way possible without memorizing anything and then move on to the ensuing slide. I'd argue that if you try to memorize lines, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I also have done um, five startups in my past past life. And um, when we were raising capital, I, we had some actually, uh, we were up in the Bay Area pitching and, and um, several of the venture capitalists up there, uh, like we had gotten there early and we had set up our laptop and we had our presentation ready to roll on this big screen in the conference, their conference room. And several, like Martin said, several of the VCs came in the room and said, close your laptop, give me the pitch. And um, you know, if you're not ready, that's kind of can be kind of nerve wracking. But again, that's why you have to really know your business inside and out and what you're trying to communicate. And, and as Bill said earlier, you're communicating a story and you got to tell the story with or without your pitch deck. Go ahead, Bill. One just quick little, and it may sound elementary, but I've actually seen it happen a couple of times. The last thing you ever want to do is read your presentation. Yeah, that's a good one. I know that sounds ridiculous. And most people would never even consider that. But every once in a while, you get one that's going through notes and trying to read it. And that is a horrible turnoff. And that's something you definitely, definitely do not want to do. So sorry, Scott, yeah, I had to throw no, it in. I, I was, I was going to underscore both of that as well. In addition to that, um, our advice and the mentors with whom you work will advise the same thing is that as you are rehearsing and preparing for your presentation, 
turn off the computer and give the presentation without the benefit of your computer on and your PowerPoint presentation in front of, front of you. It'll be a challenge, it'll be difficult. You'll have to do it dozens of times, but if you were able to internalize that, make it part of your DNA, so to speak, give the presentation without the benefit of the slides as your crutch, you're gonna come off much, much better, guarantee it. And just to get to a few questions here, since we're starting to stack up, uh, John asks, can you elaborate on the differences between the get the meeting deck and the live presentation deck? Yeah, that, that's a quick one. We already we kind of answered that. But basically, the idea is that the get the meeting deck is going to have. More, so, for example, like you might have a more like uh, on the slide that Bill's on right now, market size, you might have a more advanced version of this on the get the meeting deck than on the in the room deck. Because once again, you don't want to have. Um, you know, a bunch of like, you know, eight point font, uh, you know, paragraphs on, on your in the meeting deck, when you want people, you want the investors to be looking at you and your other co founders or whoever's giving the pitch. So that's, that's basically, um, that's basically the, the, the focus is. And so the get the meeting deck is something that, uh, like, for example, I help a lot of the startups that we mentor uh, raise capital when they're ready. I mean, you know, we're, we're mentoring about 150 right now and I'm helping four raise capital. So you get the sense, you can get the sense that uh, even though all the 150 think they're ready to raise capital, most of them aren't. Uh, that doesn't include this, this Riverside Angel Summit. I'm talking about startups that I'm helping raise their, their typically their seed round. But in any case, um, I need to have a, um, or you or anyone who's helping you raise capital they need to have something that, that, can, that can tell your story for you since you're not there in the room and you're trying to get the meeting. So that's, that's, that's the focus. Uh, Bill? I want to add to Scott's comments. Um, talk about get the meeting. I encourage clients to put together a good one-page executive summary. And we have basic templates for that, but I would encourage every entrepreneur to put together a good executive summary that kind of basically summarizes your whole uh, business plan, even if you don't have a business plan, which is, you know, that, that's fine. We've never, we've never done a deal on a business plan in the first place, but if you could put together a good detailed one page uh, and be able to have that available for prospective investors, that's like a teaser. You get that out to them, they get a chance to read that. That's designed for them to say, I want to know more. And now you get in front of them and that's when you do this whole investor presentation. But that, that executive summary is a great tool because for the most part, for example for myself as, as a consultant, I'm not gonna read anybody's business plan. I don't have the time. Uh, it, and it's just you know 25 pages long. But if you send me your executive summary, I can read one page. And if it gives me an idea and the details about who you are and what you're doing, where you're going with this, I'm on it. So just a, just a tip there for it. That's great. And uh, so Helen asks, so if we registered for the 22nd or 23rd, that's this week, when will we be assigned a mentor so we know what changes to make in the intervening week? Um, so actually, Martin and I are going to talk about this after the, and I, I need you, Martin, because just as you stepped away, but um, you can unmute yourself. But um, yeah, I mean, we got to figure this out. There's two, there's two ways we could do the 22nd or 23rd. One is just a group session where... Um, everyone's kind of working together as a team and everyone's hearing each other's uh, pitches. Some startups want that and some don't. So I don't have the exact answer. Uh, I guess we're going to have to just figure out for people that don't want to give their uh, pitch to anything other than a mentor, then they're going to have to get a one-on-one -on -one time and we'll have to get that scheduled this week. And then for those that are open to pitching in front of the group, then um, you would just show up to one of those times that's in that um, on, on the link that I put in the chat. Um, so anyway, we're, we're to, to be to be to be figured out 100 percent because we, we can't make everyone happy. But we want to assure you also that these are safe environments. Yes. Uh, and, and that uh, you are expected to stub a toe or two uh, and and make subsequent adjustments thereafter. So this is just simply practice is mostly going to be people like yours truly, Scott, uh, the mentors and so forth. And they are all here to make certain uh, that you present the optimal pitch that you look very, very well. It is, our, is, it is in our interest, our best interest 
as it is yours to give the optimal presentation. That's the only reason we're there is to make certain that your presentation will be terrific. So uh, it's a safe environment. Don't worry about pitching. And if for some reason there is something that goes wrong, that that will damage your chances. It will not. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, also, uh, for the pitch practices, we're going to record them, but we're not going to release them. So you can, the reason we record them is because some of the startups want to, want to, you know, see and hear what they actually look like. Cause a lot of times you'll do a presentation and you'll think, wow, I really nailed that. And then once you see the recording, you're like, wow, I can't believe how lame that was. Um, so you just never know until you really see the video, but um, which was what happens to me every time I review one of these, <laughs> one of these things that I've hosted, one of these, uh, uh, these workshops, but anyway, um, so yeah, so that's a good that's a good good point and a good question. But yeah, the whole idea is to help you come up with a better pitch and a better pitch deck uh, for whether it's for Riverside Angel Summit, which is what this is workshops really for. But also, there's I think a few of you who aren't part of uh, Riverside Angel Summit who are going to see this, who are going to just want to know how to do a better pitch deck. So um, Tom asks, how do we scale down projections to make them believable based on the applied industry? That's a good question. Um, we can all probably answer that. Bill, you want to start? Sure. First of all, I would um, I would definitely focus on the psalm part of your your Tam Sam and the psalm, uh, and and do your homework on that. Get a pretty good idea, you know, of what part of that market can you really capture. And I'll give you a hint. Uh, typically, if on your fifth year you're projecting around thirty forty million dollars in gross revenue you're probably within reason of what they're typically going to see. Uh, it's when you get into the 100 million or, or 200 million is when it becomes ridiculous. You know, no one's really going to scale. They typically, most entrepreneurs, if they get the $10 million, they're going to be thrilled. So it, when you talk about scaling it down, I would just try to be as realistic as you can uh, and, and, and build it that way. I mean, you can also do a two-year financial projection which I always encourage people to do to get an idea. You know, what, 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 what's the cash flow like? What, what, what kind of growth do I need to have? What are my costs going to be? And just kind of lay it out there for, for say two years. Now you've got at least a realistic number you're looking at, but you can apply that and transfer that over to your five-year plan. And I think you'll be pretty realistic and, uh, and, and go with that. And hopefully that answers your question. Just wanted to follow up also, Bill, on an earlier comment that you had made that some people might think, well, gee, that's kind of cute, but you're actually deadly serious. And that is you bet on the jockey, not on the horse. And we all know, as you also had indicated, that the numbers are more like most likely going to be wrong because, well, why wouldn't they be? But the the point here, importantly for Bill and many and mo or most investors is that they want to find out not so much whether the the numbers are realistic because most of us uh have have uh, just attempted to make the numbers look like well yeah this looks like a fairly straight slope line and so forth as opposed to the hockey stick but the real question that bill and other investors really want to hear is not so much whether the numbers are right or wrong but exactly what were you thinking and how did you come up with these numbers in the first place. If you can offer a rational, carefully thought through reasoning for why the numbers are the way they are, that's what they want to hear. Because remember, they're making a decision on you as the initial founding CEO of this venture. So they want to make certain that you can carefully and thoughtfully make decisions in terms of how the numbers are going to look and why they're going to look the way they are. They're making a decision on you, not so much on the numbers themselves. Very good yeah. point. That's a good point. Helen asks, I presume one has accompanying documentation to fill out any of the slide information as we submitted for the Riverside Angel Summit. Is this what you're intending to communicate by the brevity of the pitch deck? Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, for, for those of you that do have a business plan or you do have, um, if, if you're a deep tech startup and you have, uh, you know, like some of our biotech startups will have dozens and dozens of pages of research and or published articles or whatever they have that's all great but yeah you're going to have to you're going to have to get that into this pitch deck format because all, all investors and this we'll, we'll get this more in this the next question from dave but but yeah all investors are expecting to see what bill has in in this presentation he just gave so if you don't have that 
then you're not ready to raise capital. So, uh, and again, I just want to say, and I always have to say this, this is not about friends and family. This is about raising professional capital from professional investors, angels, and or venture capitalists. So we're not, we're not saying, we're not saying you're not ready to raise capital from, you know, uncle or aunt, whoever, or grandma or grandpa, whoever, that's up to you. We are, our program does not get involved in friends and family. We only focus on professional, what's called equity capital. So all of these answers, just make sure that you all understand that. So Helen, yes, um, you would need to, um, any of your more complicated um, documentation or papers or other thing, research uh, that you have, you'd have to get that into the pitch deck and make it a, understandable and interesting story to investors. Bill, yeah, you want to add? Uh, yeah, Scott makes a very good point. And, and I want to add to this because I've seen it too many times. A lot of this presentation is going to depend on who your audience is. So if you're a life science presenter and you're presenting to a group of people that are in that space, they can take it. They, they can take the whole presentation. They can take your acronyms. They can take the words that you use that I can't even pronounce but they're gonna understand that, okay? But if you wanna have a pitch designed for a more general audience, which opens up a greater horizon for you, I would eliminate the acronyms and I would dummy it down, <clears throat> excuse me, to the word the average person understands it. Because if they don't understand it, they're gonna nod their head, but they didn't get it. So just know who your audience is gonna be before you pitch, and that can kind of help determine, you know, any areas that you need to dummy it down. Thank you, Scott. I had to throw that in there. Yeah, no, that's a good, good addition. And Dave asks, this is, and this kind of relates to what we we're just talking about, but we'll add to it. Dave asks, team is so important to investors, plus 50% of the decision. Well, yeah, that's, that's or, or more. Uh, do you recommend this order of slides for pitches or should the team be earlier in the pitch? Um, Bill can answer that. I'll answer that. I, again, I, I see the team slide in a lot of places in the pitch decks that we get. Um, I personally, some people do put it at the very end. I would not do that. I wouldn't put it before your problem and solution slide. Some people do though. Like if you, if your biggest selling point is that you don't really know what's going on, you really don't know what your problem and solution is. You really don't know what your, your early customer discovery says, but you have like one of the most amazing startup teams ever assembled, then put your team first because you might be writing, getting a check written on the strength of just your team. So again, I'd say it's case by case. And I don't know if Bill and Martin, you want to add anything to I, where the team yeah. slide should be. Yeah, I, it's pretty, it's subjective. Uh, in my opinion, that's all I can offer here is somewhere about in the middle is where you want it. And maybe it's typically going to be right after your, your go to market strategy. Okay. After you've identified that now here is the team that's going to cause all this to happen. So once you've laid out your go-to-market strategy, that could be a perfect time to put in the team that's going to actually get this go-to-market strategy in place. So, you know, again, it's subjective. You get different opinions. For me, I have found this sequence that I showed you today to be the most compelling. But, you know, again, it's if a slide's here or there, great. Obviously, you want to start off with the, the uh, elevator pitch, okay? And you want to end it with the exit strategy. Uh, and, and those are and for, for those that that's kind of where they fit the best. So and I, and I would agree with with you, Bill, and and likewise uh, you, Scott, as well. I my personal preference is for you to convey the problem. Uh, the solutions, uh, state of the, the prevailing art right now, uh, what uh, solutions have are in the pipeline, what your solution is and so forth. And as Bill has indicated, your go-to-market strategy. Then you can present to them the team because now you're telling them, not only do we know how to get there, but we're the ones. Yeah. We've been That's there, enough. we've done that, we're a proven team. So we can take it from there, but I would prefer to see the problem and the solution and the strategy initially, and then throw the team at them as the ones that can get the job done. Yeah, the problem and the solution and the strategy, that sets the stage for the rest of it. And you know, to not have that at the beginning would be difficult because you want, you want to set the stage and have everybody understand the problem, the solution and the elevator pitch before you get into all the rest of it. So good, good point, Martin. So, Next question is, um, should we have pre-money valuation shown and where in the pitch deck? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that one. Pre-money valuation is on that slide we talked about um, where you get into the ask. Why I'm not moving forward here. Here it is. 
So yeah, this is where that would fit. And uh, you can put down your valuation. I mean, if you're if you're offering equity, okay, and you're trying to raise a million dollars, uh, they can do the math very quickly. And you know, it, it's typical. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to offer, typically it's twenty percent equity. Okay, that that's what you want to put on here. On a convertible note, what I call the cap is in reality your what you're calling your current pre money valuation. And, and Scott and Martin can share more about what a cap is later if you're not aware of it. But yeah, that's, that's, that's typically where the valuation goes. And also add to that, be prepared. And one of the most controversial issues that comes up in every presentation I've been in is the valuation will always be far more valuable to you than it will be to the investor. So just keep that in mind. And I always encourage clients that, when you're pitching and get into the Q&A and they start questioning your valuation, you tell them, you know what, once we get into due diligence, uh, we can have that discussion and be happy to have it with you. That immediately cools anybody down. They understand you're a business person. And if they got a big issue on valuation, we can solve that once we get into due diligence. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and we're going to, so tomorrow, I'm, I'm giving a talk tomorrow, we're doing a a workshop on uh, basically fundraising strategy for startups. And, um, you know, one thing we talk to startups about a lot are there are three main ways to raise capital when you start talking about, again, professional equity investors. Um, the first is you're doing what's called a priced round, which is, as Bill just said, that means you're giving up equity in your company right away. And so, um, some investors will only do priced rounds. So you also have to know who you're talking to. And that's part of what we're talking about tomorrow is how do you build this investor pipeline? How do you get meetings? How are you tracking it? Um, but so let's say that you go to an investor, then it's only what I recommend typically is that the obviously the startup start with what's best for them in the sense of typically, and this again, doesn't apply in every case, but in most cases, a post money safe is what most startups will want to go out with. And we're going to, again, we're going to have very detailed um, workshops about the differences between post money safe, convertible note and priced rounds in upcoming uh, weeks. So you definitely want to make sure to attend those if you don't understand what the differences of those are. Also, by the way, I always have to say this because mm -hmm. um, otherwise I might get in trouble, but I'm not an attorney and uh, none of us here are attorneys. So we recommend you work with an attorney to put together your fundraising paperwork. We have dozens of amazing attorneys um, all across from local to the best of the best out of Silicon Valley that we work with every week with the startups that we mentor. So if you don't have an attorney and you need one, let us know. We'll recommend them to you. We don't get any kind of um, fees or kickbacks. It's just we recommend who we think would be the best for you based on your budget and what you're trying to do. Um, but in any case, you definitely want to understand the different ways to raise capital you want to understand how to put your paperwork together so that it's professionally done and it, and it protects you down the road. And we're going to get into all that in future sessions. So um, are, uh, are there any other questions? Because we've we've gone through the, the Q&A box here. You can also raise your hand and unmute if you want to ask a question without typing it. Um, but we have time to answer more questions. So unless you all have perfect pitch decks, uh, I would recommend that you ask some more questions if you have them. If you don't, we'll all assume that your pitch decks are amazing and and um, we'll just see you at the finals uh, on November 4th. <laughs> so, no, but seriously, uh, ask, ask the questions because, uh, you know, it, it's not every day you get to um, ask questions live with a with a uh, angel investor that's done as much investing as Bill here on the on the call. So, yeah, any and, questions? And you, know, you know, frankly, everybody, even if you do think your pitch is where it ought to be, I highly, highly encourage you to uh, come join us for Scott's uh, workshop tomorrow, number one. But I also very much encourage you to participate in the two practice pitch sessions as well. Even if you feel that you are where you need to be, really think it'd be a good idea for you to join us on the practice pitches, 22nd, 23rd, 28th, and 29th. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that's the tough thing. And then the reality is, look, I mean, we're all, we're all just, we're all just talking heads here at this point until you actually start hearing from investors. I mean, one, once you, once you actually start getting investor meetings and I, I actually have meetings all week this week 
with startups who we've helped get meetings with it, with venture capitalists, and they we're going to be talking about the feedback they got. And um, oftentimes, it's not the feedback they were hoping for. So, um, in which case, then you have to decide as the as then uh, as the founder or founder team, founding team, you have to decide. Okay, is this just one off? You know bad advice from the, this investor, are they not a fit for us and we aren't going to make changes or do we need to think about, okay, maybe we aren't communicating something clearly, or maybe, maybe our business model isn't that great, or maybe whatever, whatever, whatever. So I would, I would uh, also, obviously you're going to take on board investor feedback as you give, and you will give for the most part. And of course you always hear the stories of the startup that raised capital in two weeks and da, 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 da. But I can tell you that the majority of startups that we mentor and work with, it has taken six to nine months, and I have helped them get 35 to 40 investor meetings to, in order to close these seed rounds, which are a little bit different than angel rounds, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But I know, Bill, you wanted to add something in there as well. Well, the question that didn't come up uh, is, what are investors investing in today? Right. And, and the way I'll answer that is, what they're looking for is, and I mentioned this early on, is a significant differentiator that you have that will be very clear that no one else has quite that particular differentiator. They're looking for something unique and different, something that they believe is highly scalable. And it could be a tech uh, play. It can be a medical device, uh, you know, life science. Those are the three core areas that, that we spend most of our time and probably make most of our investments in. Uh, they're looking for SaaS type platforms. I mean, again, I think more important than the product is, is going to be the team. It's going to be how you're different than other people. And that's, you know, that solution. How are you going to solve the problem and be able to understand from your own customer discovery, how big of a problem is it? Is it really a huge problem? So those are the things that, that they're looking for as they try to make that decision. And I can't emphasize again enough, it's, it's, it's your delivery. It, it's, it's, your, 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 um, it's the feeling of chemistry in the room. It's, they look at that uh, uh, tremendously, and that helps make the decision. So I, you want to make sure that you're, you're really practiced on the delivery. Okay. Yeah, that's, good. that's a good point. All right, we've got a couple more questions just came in. Um, oh, this is a good one. From Rakesh, uh, do you prefer one person doing the pitch or multiple team members? That's a great question. This is much debated by every investor that I know. <laughs> and uh, yes. what I would say, and we'll go, you go first, Bill, and then I'll add. All right. I don't like it. Investors don't like it. The solo or the team, uh, the, the choreography oftentimes does not go off well. It gets confusing. And I encourage. The, the CEO, which is who the investor wants to hear from, does the presentation himself. And then bring up any of the other team members, the CTO or the COO or whoever else you have there, bring them up to the front when they get into the Q&A and let them fire off the answers to the questions so you get a chance to show off your whole team. But from my experience, it is best to do a solo presentation. I can't be any more clear than that, Scott. You may have a different opinion. That's... <laughs> No, I, I agree. Um, we, we have a number of startups that we've mentored that, that don't take that advice. Um, I, I, have, I have seen it work. Uh, and I've actually had startups where we had uh, multiple founders uh, in, in the pitch. And again, if you really have it dialed in, it works well. But I've also seen it fail, as Bill said, so many times. And, it, and people just like lose track and forget where they are in the presentation. Yeah. And they hand it off to the CTO. And the CTO just sits there with a blank look on their face because they just have been zoning out or whatever. And so, yeah, or, or, or the COO or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with Bill's advice. There. I think that's, that's uh, I think that's good advice. Um, yeah. yeah. And then uh, Dave asks elaborate graphic design of slides on a scale of one to 10. Um, well, I'll answer that one and we can all answer that one. I mean, it doesn't have to be elaborate, but you don't want it to have it look like, you know, you, you threw it together in 10 minutes. I mean, you want, there's a certain, when you see, you start to see the startups that are getting funded, there's a certain level of quality to their pitch. And I, I and again, I'm not like, we don't, our team doesn't really get into micromanaging your font size and your, and your color palette choice. Some, some, mm -hmm. some groups in Southern California that do pitch deck coaching do, and that, and that's great if you need that help. But I would just say, um, obviously it's not 
the most important thing, but yeah, don't have it look like most of my, my decks, which look like I would not <laughs> use as any investor decks. Cause I pretty much just throw them together the template before each workshop. Don't, don't, don't take any of my decks that I've done in any of these workshops as an example of a great looking deck. I don't know if Bill and Martin want to add anything. Also, oh, Martin, I can, I, I can interject, Scott, yeah. really quickly, is that another thing that I would highly encourage you not to do is to fill your each each of your slides with long sentences. Um, it, it Number one, it forces us to try to read those sentences. And we're mere mortals. We can't listen to you and read sentences at the same time especially we guys, I guess, who can't multitask. But um, don't do that. Uh, present clauses, phrases, keywords, those types of things, the bottom line information that we need to know. Uh, some of us may be graphics oriented like yours truly, for example, but as long as I get the point across, that's all that we need to do. But I do want to encourage you to avoid uh, graphs or, or excuse me slides that are filled with long sentences um we can't read them we don't want to read them it distracts us from listening to you yeah that's a good point i um can i or, jump in there and add to that scott yeah yeah i just wanted just to, to finish oh, answering sure. dave's question just about how to get signed up for the workshops i put the uh the links in the chat so for those of you that are listening and can't see chat um we'll have to uh you can email me if you can't see the chat and we'll get you those uh, but sorry go ahead bill i was going to say the question about content and how it should look relative to graphics etc is an excellent question uh it's something that i work with all the time and i think martin covered it quite well and so did you scott i'll make a few other suggestions there uh, less is best less content less graphics uh so that the the presentation is not clouded and so full of content that they're not able to follow you. They're looking at all the content. As far as the presentation, you want it to represent you. You want it to look clean, crisp, sharp. You want it to jump out, but it doesn't have to have moving parts. It doesn't have to have wild graphics everywhere. It's just a clean uh, a slide like this one. You want, for, I just contradicted myself. For example, that giant graphic I have there could be a fourth that size. And if you had more content to put on the slide, I would also strongly recommend you number your slides. Okay, you can do that in PowerPoint. Just hit the button; it'll number the slides down in the right-hand corner. The benefit of that is when investors are listening to the presentation, they'll not they'll write down the number of the slide that they want to talk about. And when they ask you about, and let's say they come back to you and they say, "Okay, tell me about the um, uh, your financials," because they didn't have a number. You're going back and forth through all your slides trying to find that, and you could be losing time during a timed Q&A, and the goal here is to have every question you can get. So if you have them numbered and they say go to number five, boom, you go right to number five, and it's there. The only last comment, a cosmetic comment I'll make, is I recommend your, your, your fonts to never be less than 28 points. You want them to be big enough. Uh, assuming that someday you're going to actually be in a live room and somebody could be sitting 30 feet away, you want the fonts to be big enough for them to read and they're not squinting and trying to figure out what it says. So. Yeah, that's a good point. And to follow that up, Dave asked, is Bill's graphic design of his slides acceptable for investor pitches? So I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw Bill under the bus and answer that one. I'll let, I'll let Martin and, or Martin or Bill answer that one. But I, I would say, um, look, I mean, I don't want to get too overboard. I mean, I think, I think that, yeah, I think, I think bills could work. I mean, but you know, do, do his slides or my slides we're doing for the, or Martin's slides we're doing for our, these workshops compete with the best pitch decks that are getting funded? No, they don't because we're not, I don't, I, I mean, like I'm literally going to be writing the slides tonight, um, you know, after my, my, my 12 day jobs I have uh, for the, the, the thing tomorrow. So no, I, we're not definitely holding out our, our, our pitches as, um, as, as like the best design pitches, but I'll let, uh, I think we need to clarify here that first of all, the slides that Bill used today is for us. Yeah. Okay? It's not, these would not be Bill's slides to a venture capitalist or an angel investor. So first of all, that needs to be clarified. And so most likely Bill, as we all would, will want to make certain that we get the absolute bottom line information that the investors are interested in. And uh, if graphics help convey that point, great. 
but the slides that we view today by Bill were for our eyes, not investor eyes. So yeah, yeah, his, 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 his slides would be different as would all of ours, but they're still very good slides. I'm a big fan, frankly, of graphics. Okay, so um, Sharon asks, thank you, clearly our deck needs help, which, which is why this has been fantastic. In the deal section, how much have you put in how do you quantify this? Um, so I guess by how much have you put in? Oh, how do you? Oh, I see what you're saying. Sorry, I misunderstood it for a second. You're asking for for founder, uh, for the founders. How do you quantify it? Um, typically, we'll all answer. I think we should all answer this because we've all seen a lot of uh, decks. But what I would say is, you want to talk about cash put in. I do not recommend doing an hour. No one's going to care about you converting the amount of hours that you didn't get paid for your startup into some type of investment. That's not what I would want to see. And I don't believe Bill would either. So this is about if, if you put in your own cash, or let's say you have four founders, and you each put in 25k, then you would say, how much is you know, in there, you would say founders have invested 100k, but do not do any kind of, you know, lost salary calculations, or whatever, because no investor cares, they're talking about cash. That's all they care about how much cash have you and the founders put into the startup? Do you is it is that what you're talking about, Bill? Absolutely. The investors don't care about sweat equity. That doesn't count, even though it's all of us that are entrepreneurs know what we had to do to get where we're at, but that doesn't count. They're only interested in the amount of cash you put into it. And if you raise other family and friends money, if you have another investor, all of that is, is what they want to see, because the more you have involved, uh, the more risk you've mitigated, because you know it's obvious that a lot of people have got skin in the game. Um, quick defense on my on my slides. I did this deliberately more to more to show the content and the bigger graphics is just adding a little bit of fun to it. But to both both uh, Martin and Scott's point, yes, you you want to. It's the content that really matters, not so much the graphics, but it's what you're saying on that slide is what you want to focus on. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Okay, so John asks, should weaknesses along the lines of a SWOT analysis be included in a pitch deck? Well, I, I'll go ahead, Bill. You answer that, then oh, I'll no, answer you, it. I think you got the same answer. No, it's too much yeah. information. <laughs> That's my answer. Yeah, definitely no. Yeah. Um, now, if someone says what you don't want to do, and I've had this happen um, with three startups literally in the last, just the last week have come to me, and, and when I say, I say, I don't see any competition in, in your deck. And they say, well, we don't have any. That is a terrible answer. Never say that because it is just not true. Um, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, there may be one or two startups that exist that don't have competition, but I've never met any of them. I don't know that Bill has or Martin has either. So please don't say when you get asked about competition in front of an investor, we don't have any. That makes you look like a complete amateur and typically is a, is a, is a big turnoff for, for investors. Um, so um anything to add to that bill or martin yeah it your your point is a very good point and it all if you're trying to say that that means you've not done your homework and you've not done the proper research so you're weakening your whole presentation when you make a statement you have no investors or no competition because i can tell you from my experience everybody has a competitor one way or yeah, the other exactly. And even if you don't, even if you don't think you have a competitor, you do. <laughs> so, I mean, there you the, go. Yeah. well, I mean, because the reality is you might not know. So for example, uh, you might think you have no competitors, but Amazon, Google, Apple, any of the big tech giants, they may have a completely unannounced division that's about to roll out that's doing exactly what you're doing. So, you know, and I'm not saying that you would have to, obviously you're not going to know that, but don't do the homework. Cause I just, I can't tell how many startups that we mentor who have not done the competitive research analysis and that just makes you look really not good in front of investors and again as bill we've all said the main thing you're trying to do is get to the next step of the the dance you're doing with the investor here and that is the due diligence and that is where the investor or investors are going to decide if 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 he she they are going to write the check and so this is just one step along the way and um I can tell you that that's almost an immediate no if uh, invest, and I've had, because what happens is just so you know, with all the investor introductions that we make in our program, the investors will tell me afterwards what they don't tell the investors in the room. And um, and I can tell you that there, there are some things that are just, 
the, the entrepreneurs don't think are deal, deal killers at all. And saying that we have no competition is definitely one. And then some of the other ones we already talked about, you'd have to rewind this to go back and see uh, some of the other other ones. Um, I think Martin, you gotta you gotta you gotta step out uh, to go to another uh, session for SBIRCon, which we also talked about earlier. The links up above. Um, and no, I, um, no, I just I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Bill, for joining us today. And I uh, highly encourage everyone to join us for Scott's very important workshop tomorrow. And please consider the practice pitches as safe environments. It's really going to be worth your time. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And then I look forward to seeing you for the practice pitches. And Bill, again, thank you very much. I've got Martin, to go. Thank you for right. inviting me. See yeah, thanks, soon. Martin. And uh, we'll stay on for in case there are another any few last few questions. I, I, Helen, to answer your question. Um, I, yeah, I don't know why you're not seeing that the 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 um, if they're not on the website, they will be. But anyway, the, the one on the 22nd is definitely on the website under events, uh, RiversideAngelSummit.com events. The 23rd, I think they st we still need to put up. But in any case, um, just send send me an email and, and and we'll figure it out if you can't find the the way the, the registration links. I also put the registration link to uh, the event, the workshop that I'm doing tomorrow uh, in the chat. Uh, just to give you a preview of tomorrow, it is an actual workshop. So we are going to literally be looking at your spreadsheets or whatever you're using to track your investors right now. We're also going to be talking about um, w w some actual numbers around what investors are typically looking for, for different types of uh, businesses and verticals. So for example, if we're a B2B SaaS business and we have zero revenue, but an MVP, what chance do we have of raising capital? And I'll tell you, it's very low, probably close to zero. Uh, so um, we'll talk about that again. I'm not an expert in every single vertical, so we, you know I'm not going to know everyone, but I know a lot of them, dozens of verticals of what investors. They tell us because the way it works is be, before I don't just spam all of the investor contacts that I have with a bunch of random pitch decks. I talk to them on an ongoing basis to understand what their investment thesis is, what they're looking for, how much money they have left in their fund, um, if they're writing checks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we're going to go over all of that, how to find that information, how to build out your, um, whether it's a spreadsheet or you use a paid for online tool, but you're going to be building out your actual investor pipeline uh, tomorrow. So if you don't have one, that's fine. You're going to learn how to build one. If you have one, bring it. And we're going to actually uh, dive into them and, and, and uh, learn how to build a more effective one and get, get funding, basically. Um, and uh, let's see, Anon has a question. Um, how important is it to mention that I have put money into this even? Oh yeah, that's, th yeah, we covered that. So Anon, you definitely, and I think you do that in your deck if I'm not mistaken, but yeah, any investor, or excuse me, any founder, actual cash, definitely put that in uh, to your deck on your ask slide where you're talking about what the investment opportunity is. Um, right, well, this slide right here, I was looking at the Q and A box and not at the actual, uh, the deck. So yeah, just the exact, the exact slide that we're on now, just put it on the deal slide. Um, definitely. Um, all right, cool. So any other last questions, if not, we'll let Bill get out of here early. I'm sure he's got a, a, a bunch of things he needs to get done as well as, as all of us. But, um, if there are any, no last, any last questions before we, before we end here. Then if not, I'll close with my comments. I think there are some great questions today. Uh, I've enjoyed being a part of this. And, and Scott, I appreciate you inviting me. I can tell all of you the content and the workshops that Scott and Martin have coming up is, is going to be absolutely invaluable to all of you. It's going to give you the kind of practice most people never get. And I can only assure you, if you go to those different workshops and participate, you're going to feel much better and much more confident about your presentation. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that, Bill. And of course, thank you as always for all the support you give to the Southern California uh, startup community and um, for all the work you do at um, your program at UCI. And I, the last thing I will say is that Bill's right. And also don't forget, for those of you, I know that everyone who's going to watch this is uh, after the fact is not part of the Riverside Angel Summit vetting process in terms of the cut down from, from all, the, all the startups we have now to the final six. But um, the investors are going to know who participated in these workshops. And I would just say that um, if, if you're a founder and you don't participate in any of these workshops, 
and you don't go to the pitch practices and you don't meet the investors at these early investor meet and greet events and you just think you're going to show up or make the final cut to the final six based on the fact that you're an amazing founder very unlikely this is this this is ba raising capital is based on connections and people and um, to think that you know you don't show up to any of these uh, these uh, you know events in the coming months up leading up to November fourth, and you're going to make the cut down. I just wouldn't operate that way uh, because it's probably not going to happen. Um, also, you're then also losing out on opportunity not only to meet some of the mentors that that you've met uh, today and some of the, and don't forget, Bill is a mentor, but he also writes checks. So yeah, a lot of times. You, the mentors that you're working with are also angel investors, or they also have, uh, they're also partners in venture capital firms. And we do have, in addition to Bill's great talk today, we also have some actual um, uh, active VCs who are venture capitalists who are going to come and give talks. Again, that's coming up down the road here uh, on this list that you can see at the uh, RiversideAngelSummit.com that I, uh, the site that I posted in the chat. But yeah, so we really appreciate uh, the founders that did show up. Uh, we appreciate you uh, letting us uh, help you. And we look forward to working with you all to have you have the best pitch deck and pitch experience possible. And um, look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow and later in the week at the other workshops. And uh, we will sign off. So thanks everyone for attending. I'm Scott and that's Bill. So, all right, take care. See y'all. Take care. Bye-bye.